And Britney Spears, so I'm glad I don't have to use that. There we go. Okay. Put this right here. Okay, praise the Lord. Good to see you guys. Uh, just a couple, or yeah, two announcements. Uh, as you know, Pastor Scott and his family are on vacation this week. They're coming back. I think they start driving back today so we can pray for their, their safety. Um, but one announcement is that the drama team has a meeting immediately after this service today. So if you're in the drama team, then that's for you. And then secondly, um, you might all know about the Christmas Eve outreach. It's December 24th, obviously. Um, but it's at Elva uh, Rose Park, which is downtown, kind of near the Vinoy. You can always Google it. And it's going to be a lot of music, the drama, and then most importantly, the gospel. It's going to be a big outreach. Not like the Halloween where we were mobile, like walking around. It's more, it's going to be in one spot. It's more like an outdoor service. So invite people. There's even a Facebook page I saw yesterday. So it's going to be a, it's at 6 p.m., right? Christmas Eve. 6 p.m., yeah. All right, well, let's pray, and uh, we're going to open up the word. Amen. Lord, we just come before you this, uh, this morning. We thank you so much for being with us right now, Lord. You love us so much, and we thank you that you are for us and not against us, Lord. Thank you that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And thank you for your word, Lord, the promises of your word that they're true and they're sure and we can cling to them, Lord. Thank you for our pastor, Lord, and just his faithfulness to teach us your word week after week. We pray for their safety as they drive home today, Lord. And we just surrender this service to you. Please convict us and teach us, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to be in Acts 16, if you want to turn there. Now, last week, uh, Pastor Scott left off halfway through Acts 15. And the reason why we're not picking up from there, I have permission to do this, uh, because a few weeks ago, Matt actually covered about Paul and Barnabas and how they split ways. And, um, and we've talked uh, extensively last week about the reason for why Paul had gathered together with other apostles about the people that were coming in and saying, you got to be circumcised or else you're not saved. So it's kind of an a ongoing repeat. So we're going to move to chapter 16, and Scott might go back eventually one day and cover the last half of chapter uh, 15. So chapter 16, and just, just to uh, refresh your memory, some people were coming along and were saying, just like they do today, that salvation is Jesus, but it's also you have to be circumcised, you have to follow the law, you know, you, you got to make sure you do that or else you're not, gonna, you're not really saved. And that's, that's heresy. And Paul would not have any of that, nor would Peter or any of the others. And so they gathered together in Jerusalem. Because all this confusion was starting, because they were, people were starting to believe, like, oh man, do we have to, I don't know, what, is it Jesus plus something? Is it just Jesus? What is it? And they gathered together, and they nailed it down, and they said, it's not about circumcision, it's not about following the law, it's about Jesus, and that's it. And so they wrote a letter to the churches, that way they could deliver it to them and, and help them to stay on track and not be deceived by these brothers that were coming along and pointing them the wrong direction. So they wrote a letter, and they chose certain men to go with Paul and, and Barnabas, and they went off on their journey, and somewhere along the way, uh, Barnabas insisted that they take John Mark with them, and John Mark had previously deserted them, had left without, you know, being faithful to the end, and Paul was like, we're not taking that guy, no way. And, uh, and it became such a sharp disagreement that they actually parted ways completely in ministry. And that's where we are right now. Silas has taken the place of, uh, of Barnabas. So it's Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 1. So Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, a Gentile. He, Timothy, was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Now just to picture it, Paul has come into town 
And while he's there, he's hearing about Timothy. It says that he was well spoken of by the brothers. So you can imagine maybe Paul has dinner with some, some brothers and sisters one night while he's there. And maybe they say, man, Paul, have you, have you heard of that guy, Timothy, the local guy? He's a young guy, but man, he is a fireball for the Lord. He's hearing about it everywhere he goes. Maybe he goes to the synagogue and after he's spent time there reasoning with the Jews, helping them to see that Jesus is the Messiah, maybe some brothers come up to him afterward and say, man, Paul, you remind me of a guy local here. His name's Timothy. He's such a, a faithful, young man of God. And maybe Paul gets to the point where he even just turns to somebody and says, do you know Timothy? I've heard all about this guy, Timothy. And they're like, oh, Timothy, Timothy. Oh, you got to meet Timothy. You haven't met Timothy yet? He's like the talk of the town. He's faithful. He's a faithful young man of God. We're not exactly sure of, you know, his exact age, uh, but he wasn't, you know, 60 years old. He, w he was not, if you're, if you're 60, I'm not saying you're old. <laughs> but he was young. And despite his, his young age, people might think that's immature. He's immature. He was a mature man of God. So much so that he caught the attention of, of Paul. And, um, that's one of the most tragic things that I, I was, when I was pondering this, it's one of the most tragic things when a Christian will find themselves in a, uh, like a lukewarm environment, like a place where the spiritual climate is very low. Maybe uh, for me, it was in a, a Christian college. I mean, it was very lukewarm. Nobody was really on fire for the Lord. Maybe you could be stuck in a church that's really kind of complacent um, or wherever. The most tragic thing, though, is for a Christian to be in that place and over time to begin to adapt to the environment around him. And before long, he becomes just like everybody else or she becomes just like everybody else, lukewarm, and you can't even distinguish them from anyone else in that lukewarm, complacent circle. And that is the most tragic thing for a Christian. And I've seen it. I've seen it with my friends. I've seen it with people more like acquaintances when they get... Um, into a certain circle and they just begin to become so comfortable that they're no longer standing out. God has called us, like Timothy, God has called us to set the pace. Pastor Scott's talked about that before, setting the pace. So that when you're in, a, in an environment where people are just like walking very slowly, doing nothing for the Lord, you run. You set them an example. When, when you're in a place where the temperature is very low, you set it high. You become an example to the believers. That's why Paul was able to say two different times, he said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. How could he say that if he was just like everybody else? He wasn't. He was faithful. He set the temperature. He set the pace. And that's what we see Timothy doing. He's not like everybody else. He's actually well spoken of by the brothers in two different, in two different cities. He's well known all throughout the area because he's faithful to the Lord. And I would just say, if you this morning are in a place where you are not being an example to your other brothers and sisters, you're, you're lukewarm, you're comfortable, you're complacent, man, put your armor on and get up and fight for the Lord. But the Bible tells us that we're soldiers of Christ Jesus. We're not supposed to live on the sidelines and be comfortable and just watch like spectators. Like my friend Tom gave me a book one time. It was about basically sitting in the audience doing nothing. We're called to be in the battle. We're called to, to run the race, to fight the fight. And if you're going to do that, you're going to be different than other people. And that's a good thing. You remember Paul, um, I'm going to read this to you from 1 Timothy. You don't have to even turn there. Paul wrote to Timothy his first letter, and he told him something very interesting. If I can get there. He said to him, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. That's exactly what Timothy is doing. Now, when he wrote that, it was, it was further on because he, he's just now meeting Timothy. Actually, he hasn't even met him yet. But later on in his life, as Paul's watching the life and the example of Timothy, He's writing this letter, and he's like, Timothy, remember, don't let people look down on you. I know they're looking down on you. They're saying you're too young. You know, that it's, like people tell me all this all the time, and it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And if you tell it to me, I'm just going to say, that's stupid. 
when they say, oh, you're fired up for evangelism now. You, you're pretty zealous for the Lord now, but you just wait uh, when you get to be my age and have grandkids and life kind of slows down. You begin to, to slow down in life. You're not as, as zealous. I have someone I know, Ray Comfort. You, I'm sure a lot of you know of him. He's like 60-something years old, which I'm not saying that's old. He shares the gospel more than any person in the entire planet of this whole planet, Earth. Uh, <laughs> and people have told him that before. And he, I heard in a recent message where he said that when, uh, when he was like in his 20s, when he first started sharing the gospel, someone had told him that. And he looks back now 40 or so years later, and he's, he's actually doing more for the Lord than he was 40 years ago. He st- talks to more people about the Lord. That's how it should be. It shouldn't be like this decline where we get less and less and more and more comfortable. We should be faithful to the end and even more towards the end because we're getting closer to heaven, which is amazing. So Paul is hearing about Timothy. Everywhere he goes, Timothy, 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 he wants to meet him. So verse 2, I'm sorry, verse 3. So Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And you can just stop right there. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the, he has seen the Lord face to face on the road to Damascus. He has been ex, he's experienced the Lord in ways that others have never experienced him. Even at this point, he's been used by the Lord tremendously. I mean, you know he'd go on to write two-thirds of the New Testament. He would actually go to heaven and, and live, like not just stay in heaven. He writes about it in 2 Corinthians. This is, this is Paul. If anyone knows how to choose a ministry partner, it's going to be Paul. He knows what to look for. He, he knows not to pick some lazy, uninterested, unwilling to face suffering person. When Paul looks at the life and the example of Timothy, he's like, man, I want him. That's who I want to accompany me for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is a good point because if you are not willing to adapt to lukewarmness, but instead to set the temperature, to set the pace, to be an example, then you will experience more of God, and you'll be used by God more. If Timothy had been just like everybody else uh, in the area, then Paul wouldn't have looked at him and been like, I want you to, to serve with me. And Timothy would have never had the experience of being with the great apostle Paul in sharing the gospel. But because he stood out, because he was not willing to be like everybody else, he got to experience that, that blessing. And that goes for us. I mean, if you're willing, if you're not willing to adapt to lukewarmness, but you want to stand up, even if nobody else does, and just fight, and just run, and just deny yourself, share the gospel, be in the word, wake up early, do things that are uncomfortable, when no one else is doing it, then you're going to experience much of God. I think it was D.L. Moody who said, you can have as much of God as you want. People complain, oh, I don't really like, feel, I don't really experience the Lord recently. I, I just, I don't really feel him. And that could be various things, you know, sin in our lives or just a season that we're in. But a lot of times, you don't experience him as much as you want to because you don't really want to. If you really want to experience the Lord, then the cost of it is you have to deny yourself. You have to give up some comforts that maybe you don't want to give up. You have to go talk to that guy over there that God's prompting your heart to go talk to. You have to wake up earlier to spend time in prayer and the Word. No, I don't want to. No, no, no. I, I have to have my sleep, though. And I can't talk to him. I mean, he's kind of scary looking. Well, then why are you complaining? I don't, have, I don't feel the Lord. You're not even willing to be out of your comfort zone. That's the cost of having that experience with the Lord is to get out of yourself, to get out of your comfort, to get out of your own perimeters, and to be willing for the Lord to do anything he wants in you, through you, with you. That's what Timothy was willing to do, and that's his example. A lot of you are parents out here, and you know Timothy has a mom and a dad, and we learn from this passage right here that Timothy's mom was a believer. We don't, his dad was a Gentile. I think it probably implies that he wasn't saved, because we'll see further on, it kind of gives <clears throat> light to that. But Paul, I'm sorry, Timothy's mom was a Christian. She loved the Lord. When you read, and you don't have to turn there, I'm going to read it to you. Paul writes to Timothy his very last words before he's executed, before Paul is executed. He writes to Timothy. It's 2 Timothy. It's my favorite book of the Bible. 
because anyone's last words are very important. I mean, all scripture is important. It's the word of God. But if it's someone's last words, that's very important. You know, if you have a loved one that dies, you remember their last words. They're very important to you. <clears throat> These are Paul's, some of his last words. And this is what he says to Timothy. He's writing to Timothy. He says, As I remember your tears, Timothy, I long to see you, that I, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith. Now, catch this. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Timothy, I know this, this faith that you have is, is sincere. I know it is. I've seen it. And I long to see you. I long to be with you again. But I know that that faith that you have, it first dwelt in your grandma, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. And now I, I know it dwells in you as well. Paul was able to trace back to her, his grandma, Timothy's grandma, this sincere devotion to the Lord. And I'm not saying that it goes to the bloodline. You know, your grandma's saved, so therefore you're going to be saved. Definitely not true at all. But if you train up your children in the way they should go, they will not depart. If you, if you raise up your kids in the way they should go, they have it. They have it in their heart. They have it in their soul. They know the truth. They're, they're raised up in the way that they should go. They know the, the will of God. And that's how we should raise our children. When you just go a couple chapters um, ahead, Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned. This is, again, 2 Timothy. In what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He says, Timothy, from childhood you were acquainted with the truth. Where Timothy was in Lystra and Derby, the place where he was in order to actually get the eye of Paul, to get Paul to actually say, I want you to join me, was by the help of his mom and grandma. Through their prayers, through their example, through their faith, Look where it ended up, where Timothy would catch the eye of the Apostle Paul and would go on to be used by the Lord amazingly. And I can't help but think about my great-grandma, my great-grandma Burton. She loved the Lord so much, and uh, she raised all of her kids, and all of her kids, except for one, uh, serve the Lord and are faithful to the Lord. One of her kids is my grandma, which is my mom's mom, so it goes way back. And my great-grandma, Burton, she was the one that had the, the greatest impact on me for the Lord. She would always share with me. She would always share scripture with me. And on my 14th birthday, she got me the Bible. And uh, I still have it in our um, little office room. It's, it's really old now. And I began to read it all summer long, the summer between my 8th grade year and ninth grade year. And the more that I read it, the more that it just impacted me until finally... That summer, the Lord transformed my heart and entered inside of me and made me a new person. It was through the Word of God. It was the Holy Spirit, but He used my grandma. He used her faith and her example, and my other grandma too, her, her daughter, her example in my life. Don't give up on your children. Because what if Grandma uh, Lois and Mama Eunice had given up on Timothy? I mean, the Lord's sovereign, and, and I'm not saying that God needs anybody to save anybody. But it's pretty clear in Scripture, He does use us. He does use us. He does use you moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. So be, be faithful uh, with the, the children that God has given to you on loan. Okay, so Paul wants Timothy to join him. And so, middle of verse 3, he takes him and, uh, and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, hold on a second. Just a, the last chapter, that was a whole controversy. They had said, uh, if you're not circumcised, you're not saved. And remember, they had gathered together. They had agreed, no, you don't need to be circumcised. Then what in the world is Paul doing? It's like having a, he's having like a, a, one of those bipolar moments. That's not what it is. Paul knows that the gospel is the most important thing and he doesn't want anything to stand in the way of the gospel. And he knows that 
the majority of their ministry is going to be in synagogues. And in order to be in those synagogues, if, if they know that Timothy, since they know Timothy, I mean, he's well spoken of, and the other thing they know about him is that his dad, not a Jew. That's a no-no for a lot of people. And they know that he's not circumcised, and that's going to be an obstacle. That's going to be a huge obstacle. They're going to be like, I'm not listening to you. Get him out of here. You can't be, what are you, you, what are you doing in here? So Paul wants to remove any obstacle to the gospel, even to the point of doing something that you don't even have to do. Jesus didn't say, go into all the world and preach the gospel as long as you're circumcised. That's not part of the Great Commission, but Paul wants every, the, the road cleared out so the gospel can go forth. And maybe in your life, you have to let the Lord speak to you on what that might be for you, but maybe there's an obstacle in your life where maybe your coworkers, where you're not really, you have something that's a, a, a hindrance to them in order for them to hear the gospel. Here's an example. This might be a, a valid one. Maybe you're not a very good witness. You might be able to share the gospel very well, but you're not a very good worker. You're kind of lazy. You know, you don't, really, you don't really stand out from the other employees. That's definitely an obstacle to the gospel because you can give the most uh, clear and creative and funny message if you want to get them with humor. It means nothing, though, because your example is not there. So that might be an, a, uh, an obstacle you want to demolish so people can actually, at work, see your example and hear the gospel, and it goes together, and they're like, man, that's, that's very impactful. And ultimately, only the Lord, of course, can save their soul. Pray, though. Ask God to show you obstacles that you have up in your life toward the gospel. Or if it's just something that's completely not really your issue, like Paul, you know, it wasn't really his issue, but he's like, man, I want to make sure that wherever we go, we have full access for the glory of Jesus Christ. I want to make sure that the carpet is rolled out so the gospel can go forth, and I want no obstacles, and I'm even going I'm even going to go as far as having my new buddy uh, get circumcised so that it's not a hindrance. That just shows you how incredibly important the gospel is to the Apostle Paul. So they do that. Verse 4, as they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them, now notice these two words, for observance, the decisions that had been uh, reached by the elders and um, apostles who were in Jerusalem. Now that's very interesting. They delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been made. Now today, you know, we have the Bible. We're sitting right here with our Bibles open. Praise the Lord, we, even, we have these. But 2,000 years ago, they didn't have the Bible as we have it. It wasn't fully completed. They didn't, you know, have these nice pages. And so the apostles' word was the word of God because they knew, they understood that God was communicating them through the leaders, Paul and, and the others, Peter, James, John, etc. That was God's word. They, you find in the beginning of the book of Acts, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching because they knew that is the word. So in other words, what we just read right there would be equivalent to saying they opened up their Bible, they read what they needed to do, and they obeyed what they read. And that's so important. When the Bible says, um, Psalm 119, your, your word is a light to my uh, path and a lamp for my feet or vice versa, you get the idea. What's the purpose of that, though? Okay, so it's a, this Bible is a light for my path, a lamp, you know, for my feet. To what purpose? So that I can see it? So I can see the way? No, so that you can see the way so that you'll walk down the path. That's the point. The Word is meant to illuminate so that we will walk down the path. And that's what they do. That's why James says, don't be just a hearer of the Word, but be a doer. It does you no good to hear the Word, to read the Word, but then to not go and obey. You remember when Paul said all scripture, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching and correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I always think about this passage in Ephesians where Paul says we were saved by grace through faith, and then it goes on to say we were created, um, uh, do, 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 with, uh, for good works which God prepared in advance that we should do. We were created for good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So those good works that God has called us to do, 
we learn from that passage where it says all scriptures God breathes. Remember the very end of it? So that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We need the word in order to do the things that God has prepared for us to do. So in other words, people trying to figure out what's God's plan for my life? What's my purpose? What's my destiny? What's my, uh, my future? What's God's future for me? If it's not with the word, if you're not obeying the word, then you will completely miss the purpose that God has for you. It's through the word. That is God's purpose for you. That's God's future, to walk in obedience to what he has commanded us. Um, and you remember from Joshua, God says, Joshua, don't let the book of this law depart from your mouth, <clears throat> but meditate on it day and night. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, but do everything that's in it, and you'll be successful wherever you go. And he says, don't be terrified, don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. His word is meant to be obeyed. And look at the result. Verse 5, the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. So in other words, by obeying the word, by not just being a hearer but a doer, they were strengthened in their faith. And that's the true of, of us. When we actually obey what we're reading, we walk down the path of God's word we will be strengthened. And in our body, the numbers will grow because the word is being faithfully preached and lived out. And it's an honoring, it's honoring to God. It's pleasing in his sight. So verse uh, 6, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Kathy, would you mind putting up that map? Sometimes we read things and it's, it's hard to kind of visualize where things are. Let me just say this, by the way. Yesterday... I spent so long working on a map. My wife had this wonderful idea of, of chalkboard painting a cardboard box, and then I could just do the chalk over it. I spent forever working on this thing, and it ended up looking horrible. So then I figured out we, have, we do have technology here. Uh, <laughs> but, so let's see. Um, I can't really see very well. Okay, here we go. They were, let me get a little bit closer here. They, okay, here's Tarsus. Now they were, there's Derby right there and Lystra and Iconium. So Paul came to Derby and Lystra, or Lystra, however you say it. So these two places, and Timothy was well known. Remember that? That was right here. This whole area, Timothy was known as a good example. Well, they're going along, and let me just take this with me. Multitask. And it says they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So here's Asia. Oops. Wait, wait. There it is. Here's Asia. And the Lord has not allowed them to go there. And then as we continue, and when they come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus again did not allow them. So now... Bithynia, which is there. So this gives you a visual. God has closed the door for them to go here and that area. Keep that in mind, okay? I promise. It'll be helpful if you have it in your mind. Um, a lot of times in the book of Acts, it's the best book to read with maps. A lot of Bibles have maps in the back. I always like to... to, to um, see where they're going because it gives you a visual of where they are. Now, we're not told right here how the Lord stopped them, but somehow, some way, the Lord did not allow Paul and his crew, Timothy and the others, to go into Asia or Bithynia. Again, it doesn't say, you know, um, someone got sick so they couldn't go, or it doesn't say how, but it's clear that God would not allow them to go. And when you think about it, a lot of times God will lead us by using closed doors. For example, um, you'll have your mind set on this certain thing you believe God's called you to it, and you lose peace about it, the door shuts. Praise the Lord, because if you had gone down that, that door, that, down that road, you would have missed everything else that God had actually called you to. It reminds me of when I was going to be going to Romania. I was, I was sure that I was going. I was learning the language. I had Philippians, uh, a passage from Philippians memorized. In fact, Pavel si Timote... Uh, Rubia lui Christos Isus catere sut si finsi in Christos Isus caresunt in Philippi, in preona cu supravegatoris ucadiaconi, har si pace 
de la Dumnezeu tato nostru si de... I forgot the rest. But I was learning Romanian. I was learning Romanian. I had all the colors down. I had, uh, you know, uh, cafe, cafe con lapte, coffee with milk. Um, all the important things. The days of the week. Um, I forget them now. But anyways, I was sure that the Lord had called me to Romania. And I was also raising support. And, I, and support was coming in. But, you know, I began to lose peace about it. Um, probably like uh, six months before the door closed, I began to lose peace about it. But I thought maybe that was just me, just like my, my natural, uh, like, you know, because I'm leaving the country, maybe I'm just getting kind of scared. But I began to even lose sleep about it, and it was just always on my mind, and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And then the worst thing of all was when I met my wife. <laughs> because, because then I was like, man, if I were to go to Romania, what if she was my wife? And then I miss out that whole opportunity. What if I miss God's will completely? Or what if God's will is for me to go to Romania and, he's, and she's not really my wife? And I was so confused. And I really had to fast and pray. And finally one day, after our D.C. trip in 2013, um, yeah, the day after the trip, I was at a park in downtown St. Pete and I prayed specifically this. I said, Lord, if it's not your will for me to go to Romania, then I pray that you would shut the door completely. And if it is real for me to go, then just take away this lack of peace. And then also, Lord, I pray that if Melissa is my wife, I think I've said it that way, then I pray that um, we'll have a good dinner tonight. We were going to have a dinner that night. And so after that prayer, I went to um, work where I used to work, and my boss was very involved with the Romania ministry. He knew everything about it. And he called me into his office and he said, hey, Josh, just so you know, uh, Romania closed door. We can't go. You're not going to be able to go. They've been dishonest in some things about money. And so Calvary Chapel has completely taken their hand off of it. And that you're not, you're just, it's not going to work out. And I was like, what? And then I went to dinner with my beautiful wife and uh, praise the Lord. God brought us together. So the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of Jesus forbade me from going to Romania, forbid me from going to Romania. Uh, and sometimes he does that, you know, I'm sure you can recall times when he's done that in your life. Do you realize that if Paul um, had gone into Asia or, or Bithynia, then if they had gone into these places, then the rest of the chapter, which we're going to be reading in the, in the weeks to come, uh, he would not have ever made it over here to Philippi. I think I said, yeah, it's Philippi. Where he met Lydia the woman down at the river who got saved and her whole family got saved, which then resulted, uh, led them to this slave girl who was causing all sorts of trouble. Um, Paul cast out the demon. She got saved. He got arrested for it, was in jail. Uh, the jails, the, um, the Lord opened up all the doors with that earthquake and the jailer was about to kill himself. Remember that? And Paul's like, wait, 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 no one left. Don't kill yourself. And as a result, him and his whole family got saved. And the the book of Philippians was written later on to the people in Philippi. None of that would have happened had Paul gone into those places. The Lord knew what he was doing when he said, Paul, you're not going to go into Asia or Bithynia this time. I've got other plans. You can go ahead and... That's just so you know. Uh, a lot of times we have, to, we have to stand back and recognize the full, the full view of everything. We have to see the full view of everything. Obviously, we, we don't have the vision of God, but we do have faith, and we know that God says he's working all things together for our good, that he is, God is good, and everything he does is good. That we know. So when, when the door shuts, and we're like, man, this makes absolutely no sense at all, we can still stand back and say, you know what, though? I know God's faithful, and I know that he's in control of my life, and I know that ultimately I'm here to give him glory, and he's going to lead me faithfully. That you can rest on. When you have no other answers, it doesn't really make sense to you, you can rest on that. By the way, God does not owe you an explanation. God does not owe me an explanation. God, I don't understand. Like, this is so stupid. Why? God, don't be waiting at your front door for the Lord to come and deliver you an, ex an explanation for the reason of his will. Because you don't, you're not even, I don't, of this isn't offensive, but you're not even worthy of an explanation. I'm not even worthy of an explanation. Who are we to think that God revolves around us? 
as if he reports to us. We're not worthy of that. We are uh, so blessed to simply be covered by his grace. It's all pure grace. Who cares? The door shuts and you missed out on the life opportunity of a lifetime. Are you saved? Are you forgiven of your sins? Are you not going to be going to hell forever? Well, hallelujah. You might have the most horrible circumstances for right now, for this season. Maybe uh, family is just, li family life is just horrible, terrible job, uh, horrible neighbors. They're so loud. Um, whatever. But at least the grace of God has been poured out on you, and it's not going to be taken away. And God's in control, and he's sovereign. And in time, like with Paul, he's going to lead you. He's going to guide you to somewhere else. You just trust him. You just hold, in, hold on for the right. We can always trust the Lord. He is, he is more than faithful. So verse uh, 8, passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, which on that map, it was right on the water, right on the coast. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Here is what the vision was. A man of Macedonia. Macedonia was, I, I should have left it up, it's okay. Macedonia was across the water. It was on the other side, that whole region. So a man of Macedonia was standing there, uh, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So the Lord gives Paul this vision. And it's very simple. The vision is just this man over that other region, Macedonia, simply saying, come over and help us. That was the vision. Paul recognizes that man's greatest need is the gospel. So that he immediately concludes that God is calling them to preach the gospel. Remember, the guy didn't say, the, the man in Macedonia, he didn't say, come over here and preach the gospel to us. He just said, come over and help us. Paul knows not to conclude that, okay, we need to set up a, a homeless shelter over there. Not that that's bad, but that's not the main issue. Paul didn't hear, see that vision and think, wow, I think God is calling us to um, do a water filtration system so we can help their economy and get them on their feet and get them rolling. That's, not, that's okay, but Paul recognizes their greatest need is the gospel. Their greatest need is salvation. And so when he sees this vision, he immediately concludes God has called us to preach the gospel. And it says that they immediately rose up and went into Macedonia, which is where Philippi is, which is where all that stuff I just told you about, the Philippian jailer, the uh, Lydia at the river, and so on. He immediately rises to action. When God prompts your heart, gives you a vision, uh, I think the most common thing is just a prompting where you just feel like, oh, I got to talk to that person, or oh, I got to do this or that. Do it immediately. If you give time to reason it out, well, you know, let me, let me weigh it out. Because if I did that, then if you do that, Satan comes in like a bird and rods, robs that seed that was sown, that the Lord prompted you. He comes in and just robs it away because he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. When God puts something on your heart, do it immediately. And you know what? That glorifies the Lord because it takes faith to do something immediately. Uh, lack of faith would be to... Again, consider the options to write it down. Is this going to be safe? Is this going to be reasonable? Will I be look like, looked at like I'm crazy? That's not faith. That's just like I'm concerned about my image. Faith is God has spoken to me to do something. I'm going to do it. This is crazy. I know you're laughing. I know, I know, I know. I'm going to do it though because God has called me to. And actually, it's very interesting because when I was reading this passage, um, I was in Starbucks on, I think it was Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday night. And as I was reading this passage, this lady came and sat down right next to me, a Muslim woman in her full, you know, outfit, whatever you call that. And um, the moment I saw her, I knew the Lord was, was prompting me to share the gospel with her. And I had just read this about Paul immediately rising up to action. And everything in my heart was just stirred up. So I just kind of, it was on one of those benches like this, like a bench. And she was sitting where the those flower things are. So I just went, excuse me. Hi. <laughs> and, uh, but she was very friendly, fortunately. She, she didn't like slap me or anything. But I got up to her and I just said, 
and I like to use this on, on Muslim women a lot. This sounds kind of bad, but I like to, uh, I like to use this as a, a way into the gospel because it gets the conversation started. I said, I noticed that you're wearing the, um, I'm not sure what that's called, but the head covering. And she said, oh yeah, it's called a hid, hijab, hijab. I said, okay. And I, I asked her, um, I'm just curious. I see a lot of Muslim women, you know, out and about, but they don't all wear that. Why do some like yourself wear it and, and then others don't? And she explained to me how it's kind of a cultural thing and, and, you know, from there. And I've heard other explanations. Some people have told me that uh, it's because if you're, like, lukewarm, you know, you're not really devoted, then you don't wear it. But if you do, then you do wear it. So her explanation was a little bit different. But after she explained to me, I said, she's a white woman, by the way. I said, um, how long have you been a, a Muslim for? And she said, oh, about a year. I was like, really? And I said, how, how did you become a Muslim? I mean, is your family Muslim? Or, or you know, how did how'd that happen? And she told me the story about how she just didn't really have any kind of spiritual belief and she had been reading about Islam. She had gotten herself a, a Quran and began to read it and found it very intriguing and then decided that that's the path that God was speaking to her. And, um, and of course we know that it was God because the Bible says the God of this world is Satan. So lowercase g, that's the God that was leading her. And, um, and now she's devoted her life to Islam. And I was just... It was very interesting hearing her story. I was so thankful that she was willing to share it. And then I tried, I was just praying the whole time, Lord, please help me to, to share this in a way that wouldn't be like, yeah, well, you're wrong. I mean, it's true, you're wrong, but I, I don't want to. So I just said, well, that's very interesting. Thank you, you know, for sharing that. And I just said, you know, for me, um, 10 years ago, and I began to share my story of how the Lord got my attention. And I began to go through scripture and explain how the Ten Commandments show us our evil hearts and how you and I, we don't follow the Ten Commandments. You know, Muslims, they believe in a lot of the Old Testament, the prophet Moses, Isaiah, so you can use them a lot. So I said, you know, the prophet Moses gave these ten laws, which you don't follow, I don't follow. And if God is just and good, then how could he possibly let someone like you or me that's broken all of them, even just today alone, into his presence? And we went from there, and, and I explained about Jesus and and then her boyfriend or something came down, and they always ruin things, you know. He came and sat, he came and sat down, and he was very a, a distraction. But she still, he, he didn't really say anything, but just he was rolling his eyes, and just the way he, you know, carried himself was like, let's get out of here. But she listened intently, and I just pleaded with her in the most humble, gentle, loving, but not compromising way that I could. I pleaded with her to recognize that I basically put it this way. If, if this is true, then um, Satan is the greatest liar of all time, and he has done a very good job of creating many paths that are counterfeits, that are similar in some ways to the truth, but completely uh, dead end. Not even dead end, because it, it leads, obviously, in hell. And if this is true then God has commanded you to embrace Jesus as God and to surrender your life to him. And I'm pleading with you to do that. And if this is true and I'm sitting right here next to you and I don't share this with you, then either I don't really believe it's true or I just don't really care about you. But I do believe it's true and I do care about you and I want to see you in heaven one day. And then that was that. And I moved back to my seat and, and I don't know what's ever going to happen and maybe I'll never find out until... You know, we get to heaven. But I'm telling you, the moment I saw her, the Lord prompted my heart, immediately prompted my heart. And I'm not, and this is, I'm, trust me, I'm not giving glory to myself. Um, I, as Lord is my witness, I'm just saying that in that one instance, I really did obey immediately. And it was so good. It felt so good. Usually I reason things. Usually I'm like, no, Lord, because it's awkward. I mean, we're in Starbucks. People might listen into our conversation. I did that. I was with my friend Corey. He's getting married to Diane uh, in like 14 days from tomorrow, I think. And we went to Bush Gardens on Friday for his bachelor's uh, thing. And Corey's a chicken. I'm just going to go ahead and say it right now. He didn't, he refused to go on Falcon's Fury and his grandpa. I mean, not even worthy to be in this place. Just kidding. But in line for the, I, I went, I'm, I'm brave. I went. And, uh, I had to wait for like 45 minutes and I, there was a group of college students behind me and I knew that the Lord was prompting me to talk to them, but I just didn't, I didn't want to because it's so awkward in lines. People are listening. It's just so awkward. I hate sharing the gospel in lines. I just, I can't, it's like a, a fear of mine. And it took a, almost 
halfway through the line before I finally got into a conversation. And you know what? It was an awesome conversation. It was awesome. They're from Puerto Rico. My wife and I were just from Puerto Rico like two months ago during our honeymoon. So we had some things to talk about. And then, of course, got to share the gospel. I used the ride as an example. If we, if we die on this ride, you know, do you know where you're going to go? It's possible. <laughs> And look, right after, right after we rode on it, the very next ride, it got stuck in the middle. So uh, they fixed it, though. But when the Lord prompts you, even if it's not uh, sharing the gospel, maybe he prompts you to give money to somebody, to bless somebody, do it. Maybe God will prompt you um, to be a part of a certain the children's ministry or music or something. Do it. If God is leading you to do something, do it. For his glory, don't put out the options and get your little safety meter out. That's, that's really dumb. That's, not, that's a lack of faith. Ask the Lord to increase your faith so that when he prompts you, you do it. Paul, as soon as he had that vision, hey, come over here, help us. He rose up immediately, concluding, God has called us to preach the gospel in Macedonia. And immediately they sailed across the water. And the rest of the chapter uh, 16 is the fruit of Paul's choice to obey the Lord. And I just want to share, what time do we end normally? Okay, good. Okay, awesome. I want to share this um, because I think this will encourage you. The, the greatest, in my own personal life, the greatest example that I have of this happening, this Macedonia call where God prompts you to do something, you do it, and the, the fruit is amazing. The greatest example that I have and that I think about, can, I, I, always, I always go back to it because it encourages me to go on with other things. Like um, we learned from Pastor Scott, uh, past graces, uh, or maybe that was Jason, past graces increase your faith. When you think about God's faithfulness in the past, it increases your faith for what God has called you to do right now. When you look back and see the faithfulness of God all throughout your life, it encourages you right now to just stick in there and continue being faithful to the Lord. And this is one of the things I always go back to. When I used to live in Philadelphia in 2008, I, that's when I first started really sharing the gospel um, with, with strangers. And I was meeting all kinds of people and even like drug dealers and stuff. It was really cool. I got to mess up a drug cell one time. Uh, but at one point, though, I felt the Lord put on my heart. And it was actually, a, I w had woken up that morning. I was supposed to go to a barbecue. But I, I decided, I just felt like I shouldn't go, so I, I didn't. And I went downtown instead, and I was sitting in a hotel, the Marriott Hotel lobby. I used to go there to read the word because it's free coffee. And um, I was sitting there, and, and I hope it was free. And I was reading, and all of a sudden, I felt the Lord just stir my heart to go to New York City and, and share the gospel. And I had never been to New York City before, and I didn't have, definitely didn't have enough money to stay the night there. And it was already like 4 or 5 o'clock in the, in the evening by this time. And I was like, man, what am I going to do? And I, and I really, I, I reasoned. I was like, Lord, I, I, I can't really do that. I still have my journal from that time. I, I, I was reading it um, like probably two months ago. And I was reading where I just was going back and forth like, Lord, I feel like maybe you're calling me to New York City, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's you because I can't even afford to go. I mean, what am I going to do when I get there? I can't stay the night there. I can't afford a hotel. I mean, it's New York City, and plus it's dangerous. What if I get mugged? And I don't even know my way around the city. I don't even know how to get to Times Square. And that feeling would not go away. And about 45 minutes later, I walked over to Chinatown because I remember I had seen an ad where you could buy a really cheap ticket on the Chinatown bus, and it would take you from Chinatown, Philly, to Chinatown, New York City. And Chinese people are fun. So I went to... I went to Chinatown, and I got a ticket, and um, the bus left, you know, almost right away, and it was like a two-and-a-half-hour drive, went to New York, and got off uh, near, like, lower Manhattan, kind of where the World Trade Center, you know, the Twin Towers used to be, and um, now where the Freedom Tower is, and I walked down to the water. Uh, it, w it was sunset by the time I got there. It was so beautiful, and I was just walking along the um, New Jersey, whatever the river thing is there. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Yeah, where the plane landed. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I was walking along there, and I was so scared. I didn't want to talk to anybody because I was just feeling, like, really discouraged, and I just wasn't feeling that boldness, which is, you know, every day it's a battle for all of us, including myself. I, every day I feel that, that, that tug of war, like I should, but I don't, I, I just, I'm kind of scared to. And I was just be begging the Lord, please help me. And finally, I saw a couple walking along the water, 
And I got my courage up by the grace of God, and I walked up to them, and I said, excuse me, um, can I ask you guys a question? Their names were Torio and Tamara. I still remember their names. Uh, and they're like, sure. And they were so friendly. And probably spent 45 minutes with them, and it was such a good conversation. I don't remember really much of what we talked about. I mean, it was the gospel, but I just remember walking away feeling like, oh, that was such a good way to start. Thank you, Lord, for not, not being like a horrible, you know, conversation. I walked away so encouraged, and I caught the subway. I went up to uh, Times Square, and I was talking to people all over the place. I was like pumped up. I wasn't even tired. I was like filled up with energy, and um, I, every now and then I'd go into a hotel, sit down in the lobby, read the word for a little bit just to, you know, continue be, being strengthened. I'd go back out again and talk to people. And finally, at about 3 in the morning, I was in an alleyway. That's the place to be. Alleyway, New York City, 3 a.m. And I was walking along, and I saw this guy sitting on a, some, some steps. And I walked up to him, and I don't remember how I approached him, but I think I just said, hey, man, you know, can I ask you a question? And he cussed me out and told me to leave him alone and all, every word you can imagine. So I was like, okay, no problem. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, be like a, annoying. So I just, I began to walk away. And for whatever reason, the Lord did something in his heart. And he said, well, wait a second. What, what were you going to ask me? And I was like, okay. And I went back over to him. And I just said, well, it might be kind of a strange question, but I was just going to ask you if you know where you're going to go when you die. I mean, you know, it's going to happen one day. Do you know? where you're going to end up. His name was Michael, and with, I spent probably 30 minutes with him. At the end of our conversation, I wrote his words down in my journal, so I have it word for word. He said to me, you have no idea how much this conversation means to me. Your trip to New York City was not in vain. Because I told him how I'd come from Philly, and that God had prompted my heart to come. And I was like, man, it's amazing. Now look, my jaw was already down, right? Here's even more. As my jaw is down, I'm like, wow. I hear from a distance, Josh? Josh? And I was like, I mean, who knows me? And I wasn't even bald at that time. So I, it's not like you can really pick me out. And I was like, and I couldn't see, I couldn't really make out who the person was. Man, it was Torio. Remember that couple Torio and Tamara? This is eight hours later. I'm, we're talking 60 blocks uptown. Do you know how far World Trade Center is from Times Square? That's a long ways away in a city of hundreds of thousands of people. And here he is at 3.30 in the morning in an alleyway that I happened to be in. And we got to pick up right where we left off. And this time he wasn't with his girlfriend, so it was kind of nice. We just got to be, you know, he was very focused. He happened to be playing at a band in a club nearby. That's how, why he was in that alleyway. And I was just like, man, can this night, like, get any more amazing? And after talking to him, I met some police officers, and we talked about the 9-11 and some details. He told me about how you could smell certain scents in the air when that happened and um, got to use that. And finally, I went to McDonald's. I was starting to get a little tired, and I got some coffee, and I was reading the Word. And um, I remember when I, I from the McDonald's uh, window, I could see Good Morning America, the, uh, the studios from the window. I thought, man, that'd be so cool to watch them film. And it was a weekday. So I walked over there. There was a long line of people with their signs, like, hey, mom, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, they were all, you know, part of the, they had um, gotten tickets to be in the audience. If you do that in advance, you can be part of the, the live studio audience. So I waited in line. I knew I wasn't going to get in, but I just wanted to watch them film stuff. I love filming. Like, I love watching that. So I was seeing the cameras got, uh, getting set up. I saw Kevin Costner come in the door because he was um, the, the guest. And finally the lady came out, and she uh, collects tickets. And she got to me and she said, do you have your ticket? And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not really with, the, with these guys. I'm just watching, actually. And she's like, okay. And then she skipped me on, went on. And then she came back to me and she said, you know what? You're really the only one here that doesn't have a ticket. We'll go ahead and let you in. You can be part of the live studio audience. I was like, are you serious? So I went in and for two hours I stood there. I was on TV. My mom saw me. Uh, for two hours, to, for, for two hours, uh, you have to just stand there. You can't really talk. You know, they tell you when to laugh and stuff. So I couldn't really, I couldn't really like, talk to anybody. And I started getting discouraged because I thought, man, Lord, was this kind of, was this vain? Like, should I have not come in here? Because I'm not really able to talk to anybody. Maybe that was, like, just my own, you know, fleshly choice. And then I thought, you know what? I want to share the gospel with Diane Sawyer. I really do. And so at the end of the show, uh, they give you a chance to take pictures with everybody, you know, with the, the guests and the, the anchors and stuff. And so God gave me wisdom. 
give me wisdom to wait to, the, to be the last person. That way there's no one behind me, so no one can be rushing me. And, and so I waited till everyone had gone. And then Diane Sawyer said, okay, come on up. And so I went up to her, and she's like, okay, you want a picture? And I said, no, I didn't have a camera. I was like, no, no, no. I actually just wanted to, just, I wanted to give you something. And I gave her a, a gospel, a booklet that I had at the time. And, for, and it was her and the uh, weatherman who's gay, um, Sam uh, Champion. And for the uh, probably two minutes, I mean, it was very short, but it was enough to share the gospel. I got to share the gospel with them. And at the end, there, uh, Diane, Diane in particular, she said, thank you so much, and gave me like, kind of one of those side hugs. And then I walked out of the studio, and I went to a park and fell asleep on a bench. I was so tired. <laughs> and I went to New York City four more times that year. And God did one time with a friend, the other times just with the Lord, and God did great things. When God prompts you with something, just do it immediately. Because if you do, there is so much fruit that comes out of it. So my prayer is that, uh, like Timothy, that you would choose not to be like everybody else. Look, uh, even in this church, this is a good church. This is like a rare church. But still, don't be like everybody else. Like maybe um, God has called you in a certain area or, or prompted your heart in a certain area, but that certain area, not really anybody else kind of does or, or um, is interested in. Don't let that stop you from being faithful to the Lord. I remember my friend, Nikkel, who uh, her and Jason aren't here today, but the Lord put it on her heart when she, um, how do I put this the best way? The Lord put it on her heart one time at a former church to um, have a tambourine and to bring it in and, and do worship in the service. Because she just, she was reading the Psalms and it talks about um, having that music and having you play to the Lord and have, making a joyful noise. And she felt so burdened to bring it in and just have that with her as part of her worship. Unfortunately, they stopped her from doing it. But, but listen, that's the kind of thing, though. She felt something from the Lord, and she did it. And even though it got a closed door, praise the Lord that she did it because the Lord was so blessed. I'm sure the Lord was smiling at her heart of worship. Timothy was not like everybody else. He was an example. He was faithful to the Lord. He was well spoken of by the believers. So much so that Paul, the great apostle Paul, looked at his life, his example, and was like, man, that's the kind of person that I want to glorify the Lord with. That's the kind of person I want to share the gospel with. He went in and removed all the obstacles that he could possibly think of. Paul did. That way the gospel could go forth with no kind of hindrance. It could just make its way down through the synagogue, through the streets, through the region, so people would hear it and be saved. That was his greatest desire. And then as they're going along and, and the Lord is, di is directing them by using closed doors, he doesn't grumble. He's not like, Lord, I want to go to Asia. Paul's like, you know what? We're not going to go to Asia. I don't really understand why, but the Lord's told us not to go. So um, let's just keep making our way. And as we make our way, God's going to give further direction. Sure enough, here's a vision for you, Paul. Here's a man of Macedonia saying, come over and help us. Paul recognizes it's from the Lord. You know what? God's called us to preach the gospel in Macedonia. And immediately they go. Let that be the, the flow of our life, that God leads us and we obey, that we dare to be different. We're not like everybody else. Even if we're in a place where everyone's complacent, we don't have to be complacent. Be an example. Be an example for other believers. And when you read the word like these guys, read it and obey it. Or like my friend says, read and heed the Word of God. And then you'll experience so much more of God than you've ever imagined. And you'll be used by God so much more than you imagine. I want to close with this. Um, John, I know he's not really mentioned in this passage. I don't think he's really even in this, uh, in this section. I don't, I don't think at least. But John is a very faithful example. In the very beginning of the book of Acts, you find John with Peter. They were pretty close, you know, when it came to ministry. And you find him. You remember, he came into the temple at the time of prayer, and there was a crippled man there, and he was begging for money, and Peter and John said, you know, we don't have silver or gold, but what we do have, what we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And the guy got up and walked and was like jumping around, and people that were watching who knew this guy, he was there even back in Jesus' day when Jesus was walking into the temple. I'm sure Jesus passed him before. People were stunned 
and a crowd gathered, and Peter took that opportunity when that crowd was there to preach the gospel. And it resulted in him and John going to jail. And in jail, they beat them, and then they told Peter and John, they said, no more, no more teaching and preaching in this, this name, Jesus, no more of that. And it says, Acts chapter uh, 5, it says, and Peter and John replied, we cannot help but speak what we have seen and heard. Now, here's the reason why I mentioned that. Because maybe 40, I don't know the exact years, but maybe 40 years later, I just know John was a really old, old man when he sat down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and wrote 1 John. He is, I, I think I read one place that he was maybe even uh, close to 100 years old. And he's writing, that's why he says a lot of times, he says, my little children, my dear children. He's an old man. So remember, 40, 50 something years later, he's writing and he says this. Oops, hang on, that's Second Peter. He says, um, I'm almost there. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. He was an eyewitness. He saw the Lord when, uh, on the mountain when the transfiguration happened. I mean, he, he's, John saw a lot. So eyewitnesses of when we, um, are, we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Here it is. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we write these things to you so that your joy may be complete. Here's the the thing that caught my eye is that John, in the very beginning of his time serving the Lord, says to these people, telling him no more. He says, we can't help it but to speak what we've seen and heard. And throughout all the years of persecution, being banished on the island of Patmos, having oil cover his entire body, um, experiencing the loss of every one of his friends to murder because of their faith in Christ. He was the last one uh, to die, uh, last of the apostles. But yet, at the end of his life, he's able to say the same thing. We proclaim what we've seen and heard. And then he gives the little secret to why he's still able to do it. Because our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. It's because of John's fellowship with the Lord for 50-something years that he was able to continue and continue and continue proclaiming what he had seen and heard. Even with persecution right there, even with the loss of his friends, because of his fellowship with the Lord, because of his intimacy with the Lord, he remained faithful. That's the same thing for us, Timothy, Paul, all of us. Our fellowship with the Lord is what will affect our effectiveness for the Lord. If you're not having that intimate time with the Lord, where you're in the Word and in prayer, and you're just having this vibrant relationship with the Lord, then you will miss out on everything that God has prepared in advance for you to to experience and to do for Him. So Lord... We thank you so much for your word. Thank you, God, for your example to us through Timothy, through Paul, through John, through others. Thank you so much, Lord. You care about us, Lord, and you have given up your son in order to redeem us for yourself. I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord, that you would stir their hearts and their minds, Lord, that They would have an increase of faith so that when you prompt them to do something, they would do it immediately. Lord, I pray that we would refuse to adapt to lukewarmness, but like Timothy, we would be an example. We would stand out, even if it's uncomfortable, Lord. I pray that we would hear your word, read your word, and then actually obey it. Walk down the path of your your commands, Lord. Help us not to be frustrated when we're in circumstances that are really discouraging, when we have experienced a closed door or just a situation that's very difficult, help us to uh, step back and recognize your sovereignty, that you're in control, and that we are covered in your grace. 
Thank you, Lord, for the promise that we have of being with you in heaven forever and that today is one day closer to heaven. We praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, one last thing. If you all would just stand up with me for a moment. Okay. Once everybody's standing. Okay. Would anybody in here say that I'm not, that I'm not sinful? Right? Okay. All right? Everybody, okay, okay. We're all on the same page. So you all believe that I'm not God. Okay, good. All right, awesome, awesome. So if a sinful man can say to you, please stand up and you obey him, then what about when the king of kings says, go into all the world and preach the gospel? How can we respond to him differently? We say, all oh, stand up, sure. Oh, go, uh, Jesus, no, I'm actually, I'm a bit busy right now. I've got things going on in my life right now. And no, it's a little awkward if I go over there and share the gospel. And if the Lord tells you to do something, you do it. Amen. Praise the Lord.